So if there's one slide you need to take home in terms of where we stand with fertility preservation, it would be this one. This summarizes our fertility preservation strategies. We're talking about mostly female today. But in the male, for adults, situation is easier because semen cryopreservation is very successful. Um, and even if we have one vial of sperm, since we have intracytoplasmic sperm injection where we can match one sperm and one egg, we can make it last a lifetime. In the prepubertal boy, you cannot do that. So we, there are several experimental protocols, and we're one of those that run this, where boys undergo testicular cryopreservation for future transplantation or stem cell extraction from this tissue to recolonize the remaining testes. So we're not going to talk much about that. But if we have uh, a female coming to us for evaluation, we look at two things. One is that, is the ovary involved? Because if the ovary is involved in cancer, you don't want to save this tissue and later on transplant it back to the patient. So that limits our options. If uh, there is no ovarian involvement, and if this patient only needs radiation to pelvis, we can transpose ovaries and uh, protect the ovary in 50% of the time. It's not always working. But if there will be chemotherapy, then our best friend is time. Because the more time we have, the more things we can do that are established, such as embryo cryopreservation. So if we can delay chemotherapy and stimulate this patient for about two weeks, we can collect eggs, either to freeze eggs or embryos. And in children who are not mature enough to be stimulated, our only option is ovarian tissue freezing. Let's talk about embryo and oocyte cryopreservation, fertility preservation. First of all, if you want to do this, you need to, and you want to do it efficiently, you need to give these patients fertility drugs, follicle stimulating hormone, for about two weeks or so. So that means you need to have that time. Not every cancer patient has that, but some do, especially breast cancer patients. And then, as you know, these egg retrievals are done transvaginally, very non-invasive, but timing is essential in this situation. Now, breast cancer is an exception. In breast cancer, after the initial diagnosis, there's usually four to six weeks before they have breast surgery. And then they usually wait about six weeks or longer before they start chemotherapy. So you have two windows of opportunity where the patient undergo ovarian stimulation. And, uh, um, have oocyte or embryo freezing. As a matter of fact, if these patients are referred before breast surgery, as we showed previously for evaluation, we could even squeeze two oocyte retrievals in that time period. So early referral increases their, their chance of success in fertility uh, preservation. Now, as I said, in breast cancer, there is sufficient time between surgery and chemotherapy. But the problem with that is, this being mostly estrogen sensitive type of cancer, conventional stimulation was always avoided up until seven, eight years ago. And people tried natural cycle IVF. That is no stimulation. You try to collect an egg and try to fertilize, which only about 60% of the time you get an embryo. So this bothered me. And uh, back about 10 years ago, when I was at Cornell, started looking at what is out there that it could be good for cancer and good for ovarian stimulation. So the first drug that I looked at was tamoxifen. Now tamoxifen is an estrogen receptor agonist antagonist, but I don't know how many of you knew that it was first tested as a postcoital contraceptive in the UK. And then when they realized that everybody was conceiving, they said, wait a minute, something's going on here. And then they realized that it was actually inducing ovulation. But shortly after, they also found that it had the anti-breast cancer characteristics. And just then, tamoxifen became the cancer drug. As a matter of fact, it's a very close uh, cousin of clomiphene. And many countries still use tamoxifen. Here's one randomized study from this country. Compared tamoxifen versus clomiphene in polycystic ovary syndrome. Now, 20 to 60 milligrams of tamoxifen is comparable to 50 to 150 milligrams of clomiphene. In cancer, the cancer dose, pre preventive dose is 20 milligrams of breast cancer or less, depending on which country you're from, right? Correct me, my oncologist colleagues. Um, so when they randomized these patients, uh, their ovulation rates were same, and cycle fecundity was also same. 
And one thing about tamoxifen, it does not alter cervical mucus, it does not alter endometrium, so it could be a better stimulant in terms of uh, ovarian induction in uh, um, polycystic ovary patients. Uh, as you know, about 15 to 20 percent of the cycles, in the clomid cycles, you have impaired endometrium and, and cervical mucus, which can interfere with success in, uh, in your regular fertility patients. So tamoxifen uh, being a drug that is also used for hormonal treatment of breast cancer in premenopausal women, this was one natural choice of ovulation induction. Second is another drug, letrozole, which is the choice of hormonal treatment for postmenopausal cancer. But if you give this drug to premenopausal women, it induces uh, ovulation. How does it do it? When you block aromatase, which converts androgens to estrogen, it cuts the negative feedback to hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus then adjusts to produce more FSH. So you're blocking negative feedback and it induces ovarian follicle stimulation. So studies looked at this and compared letrozole with clomid as well for ovulation induction, same way, five days the way you use clomid, but the dose being 2.5 milligrams. So in this randomized study, comparing 100 milligrams of clomid to 2.5 milligrams of letrozole in unexplained fertility, what they found was that follicle counts were similar, endometrial thickness similar, and in the end pregnancy rates, again, small study, uh, the difference is not significant, but numerically you can see that result did better. Then another study looked at whether the higher dose is better. Now in cancer, this is the dose they use. As a matter of fact, the higher 5 milligram dose induces larger number of follicles. So taking that pre-existing information, I said, well, we got to study these drugs, tamoxifen and letrozole in women with breast cancer. They both block effects of estrogen. Why can't we use that to our advantage in women with estrogen sensitive cancer? So we ran this prospective study and uh, we compared tamoxifen alone and next tamoxifen with FSH and then letrozole with FSH. So letrozole would shut down estrogen production and FSH then add another boost on top of that. So over time we compared these three protocols and see which one was superior in terms of certain outcomes in the IVF. And what we found was that you, when you use tamoxifen or FSH, you had the highest estrogen levels, which is not a big surprise. Tamoxifen does not suppress estrogen levels. So if you have a patient who comes to your office who's on tamoxifen and who's premenopausal, if you do an ultrasound, you'll see her ovaries are full of cysts because it's ovulation induction agent stimulating, and her estrogen levels will be in thousands. Yet it still protects the breast. It's blocking receptors in breast tissue. But what we found was that letrozole FSH produced much larger number of mature oocytes. So we stuck with that, and then the rest of the studies continued with that. Some of our colleagues asked us, so, well, we have standard IVF, are you impairing success rates? So what we did was we compared our protocol with standard IVF protocols in non-cancer patients, because we do not do standard protocols in cancer patients with estrogen sensitive human. And these patients had male factor infertility, that means women were, infertile, were fertile, because women with cancer are fertile, so their response would be better. So when we compare these two groups, we found that you actually had a similar number of embryos generated from IVF. But what we found was that if you threw a letrozole on top of FSH, the total amount of FSH you used was 40% lower than the standard IVF. At that point, the drug companies started to stop talking to me, because that means Patients would use 40% less, right? <laughs> so for that reason, I named this protocol COSTLESS, Controlled Ovarian Stimulation with Letrozole Supplementation Study. So tongue in cheek, COSTLESS. <laughs> All right, I think you're going to withdraw your sponsorship from this. <laughs> but what's more, most important, when we have cancer patients, we're trying to give them babies, but the more important thing is, are we giving, doing them any harm, right? So we followed these patients out and, s and looked at their last week survival rates. Here's the letrozole group and here's the control group. Letrozole group up here and control group up here. So no difference in recurrence. And we're following these controls. Interesting, on a recent look at this, it seems that patients who we did IVF and preserved their eggs have a lower percentage of recurrence. 
And recently I saw an abstract in one of the uh, ASCO uh, uh, throwaway uh, newspapers, and, and they're talking about letrozole as a neoadjuvant treatment before even chemotherapy, instead of advantage some advantage. So are we potentially doing a favor to these patients by even actually stimulating them? Obviously, you know, our data is preliminary. But at least we know that we're not even causing harm. 